Well, welcome to our presentation. Please make yourself comfortable. I gave this uh, presentation to the Falkirk Local History Society in early 2020. And of course, my topic was to explain something of the history of the dyes, which is the affectionate name for the chemical plant in Grangemouth, where many of Scotland's dye stuffs were pioneered and where there has now been about a century of continuous manufacturing on the site. I had spent about 30 years in the chemical dye and pharmaceutical industries, a number of times um, in Grangemouth, ICI Grangemouth as it was then, and I left uh, the site um, for the final time in 2011, having been the site manager and manufacturing director there. Many people will be familiar with Grangemouth as a centre of chemical manufacturing, most associated with the large-scale oil, uh, gas and petrochemicals activities historically uh, from Scottish oils to British Petroleum and latterly INEOS who now operate there. But there is much more to the Scottish chemical industry and the chemical manufacturing in Grangemouth. And that's partly the subject of my presentation here. Much earlier in Scotland, pioneering um, people such as John Roebuck, who had founded the Caron Ironworks in Falkirk, and had built a sulfuric acid plant at Preston Pans in the middle of the 18th century, uh, probably considered one of the first larger scale chemical plants in the UK. Shortly after that, um, Cochrane had produced coal tar on his estate at Corus. And it is of course well known that uh, Scotland's alkali industry had grown up linked to the textile bleaching, dyeing and soap making activities typified by tenants St. Rollock's famous works in Glasgow in 1797. Much later, the early oil industry had started in West Lothian and that was the oil shale industry. That business originated by Paraffin Young with his oil works at Bathgate, the remnant of which can be seen in the large Bing piles that are still visible as you drive towards Edinburgh. Probably the first chemical works in Grangemouth could be thought of as the Cooperative Society Soap Works. It was built in 1899 and operated for many years until the 60s. The building itself was demolished in 2005 and I took this photograph during the demolition work. The subject of this presentation is of course the Earls Road site which formerly known as the dyes had been built in 1919 and you can see its location at the center of this picture looking east towards the port of Grangemouth in the distance. The actual manufacture of these dye stuffs began in 1920. By the 1940s the site had grown into a large ICI site, Britain's largest chemical company, part of Britain's largest chemical company. This is a fantastic photograph uh, with lots of detail, which I've always uh, 
light. I, I was fortunate to find it in a dusty alcove and spent quite a bit of time restoring it to its original standard so that you could pick out the details of the site as it was shown in the late 40s. As I said earlier, my connection to Grangemouth started in the 1980s when I got my first job there as a chemical engineer and later as a production manager in this very old plant. Strangely, it brought back memories of an even earlier experience of the chemical industry. As I remember walking past old pigment works in the Midlands with my mother and asking, what's all that colour and mess on the walls and pavement everywhere? And uh, she had just said, well, it's some sort of old chemical plant belonging to ICI. My interest in industrial history had actually started properly when I went for a job interview in Huddersfield and I had noticed an old stone tank which is part of the old aniline operations there from the 1860s and that had sort of sparked my interest in finding out more about the early chemical industry, in particular the old dyestuffs industry. Well, I started to keep all the notes and photos and documents that I came across, often in old um, attics or dusty cupboards, sometimes when new businesses came and went, uh, sometimes when people cleared out old offices, I would try to retrieve some of the material. People used to send me things um, knowing of my interest. I did reach the point where I started to wonder what to do with my archive collection. I was fortunate to be aware of the very enthusiastic band of volunteers who run the small Grangemouth Heritage Centre in the town and they were happy to take quite a few of the materials I'd collected and particularly the artifacts and I also suggested that we produce a book uh, or I write a book which we could then sell to help raise funds for the trust and this is exactly what took place. Certainly the use of uh, dyes and pigments goes back uh, to ancient times. You have examples of uh, cave paintings in France using pigments from uh, ochre and uh, carbon black dating from 15,000 BC. You can find evidence in uh, Neolithic excavations from 6,000 years ago. There were obviously Egyptians using blues and other colors. Uh, mercury sulfide, red cinnabar was used. Vermilion was used in China and much later we can see the Romans using uh, the famous uh, murex uh, shells to create uh, purple and it made purple one of those important dyes which only the imperial family could use. So many shells were required, 10,000 to produce a mere gram of dye. By the Middle Ages uh, there was obviously a growth in the types of fabrics and colors that were available and they became symbols of wealth and power. Although in more primitive societies, it was certainly true that lichens, mosses, native plants were continually used to produce uh, colors. By the modern era, we see that dyes and pigments are part of the everyday part of the world and fashion is key and the way we decorate our homes and the things around us is just taken for granted. As I have said, certainly in the last 300 years there has been a development of modern uh, 
dyes, but prior to the 1700s, all the dyes uh, and pigments that we use were based on natural colorants. Some of the early so-called chemists, or really alchemists, experimented by combining different chemicals and created many of the early colors. None of these were understood in modern chemical terms, but some of them were very important to the industry. This is a picture I, I have from a visit to a recreated laboratory in Switzerland. The single most important discovery occurred in 1856 with the creation by a young English student of chemistry, William Perkin, who was working in London in his own laboratory. Perkin had actually set out to synthesize quinine used in the treatment of malaria from aniline, but noted instead that one of the products of a reaction he was studying was violet in color, and he ascertained that this might be useful for coloring wool and silk. He was able to pattern his reaction to produce the first synthetic dye in the world, and he began plans to manufacture it under the name of Movine. Perkin, in effect, had founded the synthetic dyes industry an industry that was very keen to take up his new product. Here's a picture of Perkin at the end of his career at his Golden Jubilee when he received a knighthood for his work in dyes. As I've said before, purple was an important colour to the ancients and the Romans, but by the Victorian era, it had become a very desired and fashionable color, and the availability of Movine made that more so. The development of Perkins Mauve had actually led to many more chemists entering the field of synthetic dye manufacture and production, and soon there were many, many other colors available. The Germans, however, took the lead in manufacturing and research in dyes. As early as the 1880s, they had created large factories such as the one on the Rhine at Ludwigshaven. It's an opportunity for James Morton, who I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about as the founder of um, the Grangemouth site. James Morton, born in 1867 and the founder of the Scottish Dyes Company, was also the founder of the Grangemouth Works, having first created a textile and dye business in Carlisle, he expanded towards Grangemouth in 1919. He was a man of determination, but one who could lead and inspire others, himself not being technically qualified in chemistry or engineering. Morton's family had actually started a textile company in the 1860s. His father, Alexander, had been a weaver in the handloom industry and had introduced uh, some degree of automation and created quite a large textile business based around Darville in the Ayrshire Valley there.
by the 1900s the business had expanded to Carlisle and they were producing um, many fine textiles. James Morton, Alexander's second son, was responsible for some of the design work and he had a particular interest in creating tapestries that were fashionable in shops such as Liberty of London. On a visit to Liberty's in Regent Street, Morton himself noticed that many of his fine tapestries had within a month or two faded and washed out and he felt that something was certainly wrong with the dyes that were being used to create the colours. He said later that they were all wilted away. He decided to set up a test of as many different fabrics and dyes as he could find. He placed cards over the dye samples, exposing half of the sample to the bright sun of his greenhouse, much to the annoyance of his gardener, and leaving the other part of the sample covered. From this experiment, he tested hundreds of samples for light fastness and was able to identify that some of the best results were obtained with fast dyes based on the Indenthrene series of dyes, a series of relatively newly invented German dyes. Morton was able to create a range of dyes which he christened Sunder. Fabrics and dyes chosen for their fastness In a marketing first, he guaranteed that anybody buying his fabrics dyed with the select dyes that he had chosen would never fade, and if they did, he would replace them. He used demonstrations such as this on the left um, hand side of the model, which show the dyes washed out when exposed to the sun after only three weeks in a conventional dye, but his dyes on the right do not seem to be affected, and this was a very affecting, effective marketing tool. So effective that even the Emperor of Germany and his officers were buying uniforms based on Morton's fabrics. Of course, Germany at this time was making 90% of all the dyes imported into the UK. So it was going to be a serious problem when the, the war ended dye imports. This left Morton unable to obtain the dyes that were so important for his business. So he assembled a capable team of engineers and chemists to build an ad hoc plant in Carlisle to manufacture his own dyes. This is a picture of the dye plant, very primitive. He was often criticised by those in the industry who thought of him, as he says, more of a weaver than a dye maker, but he was determined to show them wrong. At the time, the vat dyes he was using, based on anthraquinone, which is derived from coal tar residues, needed specific reaction conditions such as very high pressures, and to achieve that we need a special reactor, which was not normally available in Britain at that time. But only a, less than a year later, Morton had made the first commercial quantities of these important dyes, indenthrene, blue and yellow. As the business became successful, he actually ran out of space and labour in Carlisle and began to think about the location of a new site. He selected finally Grangemouth, having looked at some other coastal sites. Principally, of course, a nice flat area in Stirlingshire with plenty with of course plenty of this stuff water water from the river <laughs> 
Karen, both to provide water for processing the dyes, but also to provide a route out to deposit effluent after the manufacture, something that wouldn't, of course, be acceptable today. It is the port of Grangemouth which importantly had developed as a result of the building of the Forth and Clyde Canal in the late 18th century, which itself had led to the growth of the town, which again attracted Morton to the town that was well connected in transport terms. It was this man, Sir Lawrence Dundas, who had uh, been an Edinburgh merchant and got his money from providing the Hanoverians with supplies during the various wars of the 18th century, who was able to invest in the new canal project, the canal which passed partly over his property in West Curse and allowed the canal to reach the Firth of Forth in a better way than it would have done if it hadn't passed over his land. Of course, he was able to reap a good return on his investment as a result. The West Curse at Grangemouth had been occupied over the centuries by a number of important families, but Dundas had bought the house and the land which was later to constitute the location of the chemical site on the Earls Road and built a larger Victorian style mansion house. Here's a map of the estate which fits in and about where the modern chemical site is located and you can see that the port of Grangemouth was very nearby with its various basins uh, and the river running along uh, to the east. Of course, with the building of a chemical site on his old estate, the house uh, was no longer occupied by the family and it fell into ruin, uh, not helped, of course, by the uh, the Second World War when it was used uh, for training the, the local home guard. Interestingly, um, the site was redeveloped uh, about uh, six years ago into a warehouse and distribution centre for ASDA and uh, some archaeology took place to find the original foundations of the house and they were exposed um, as can be seen in the photograph on the right. Morton's original company was um, a, a textile company, but he formed an offshoot called Scottish Dyes Limited. And I was very lucky when uh, conducting some of the research for the book to find the notes left by a certain Sidney Dunworth, who'd been a chemist at the company. He had started as a young chemist in 1916 and didn't retire until um, 1959 and he wrote some notes about his time in the company which was extremely useful because he captures many of the aspects of the early company. It's rather long-winded but he does say um, that life in those days was, was pretty unregulated that quite often the meals were taken on the plant just as the job had to go on. There was a lot of enthusiasm, but you get the impression it was very much an experimental factory with uh, very little of the modern health and safety or structure of a modern company. Dunworth refers to the first site manager there, John Thomas, who was also the chief chemist. He used to work out the costs of new products on an old envelope, literally, uh, and find time for his meals between 
shifts on plant supervising the job you get the impression that everything was done with the minimum of bureaucracy a world away from the modern chemical manufacturing industry Grangemouth site was seen as an important addition to the industrial development of the Grangemouth town and featured in the local paper when the town council approved plans for the new site in July 1919. Road construction began in September 1919. Before the dies was built, the view would have been largely one of pasture land used for sheep grazing and other agricultural activities. I was lucky to find some old glass plate slides and these do very clearly illustrate the nature of the early plants. They were certainly modern by any other standard and seen as incorporating the latest thinking in chemical plant works design. By modern standards, of course, the plants were pretty basic and uh, there would have been an absence of protective equipment or um, mechanical aids to help uh, the operators. Two shown here in the early 1920s smiling amongst the acids and other chemicals and the, the bubbling uh, steam pots. Of course, the early days of uh, production were not easy because there had been a boom after the First World War, but uh, there were a number of strikes at the time in the early 20s, and then the government removed import controls and uh, many of the German dyes that had been prevented from coming into the country now flooded in, and particularly as there were some repatriation payments made in dyes. But Morton kept his chemists researching and they were active in finding new chemical compounds which could be used in the dye industry. Sales gradually grew and by 1924 they were making about three quarters of a million pounds of dye. Some of the innovations that uh, followed in this period included the famous green dye, Caledon Jade Green, one of the most um, fast and strongest green colors ever produced in the VAT dye series, shown here in its chemical form, and with the its creator, uh, Dr. Robert Thompson, who created um, many of the dyes that led to the success of the Scottish Dyes Company. Morton's achievement, not only creating the new site in Grangemouth, but also the way that his team created many new dyes that hadn't been made in other companies before. A reflection by one of the process foremans written uh, in the 30s but talking about his time in the 20s he says that conditions inside the sheds had a lot to do with the dyes factory having a bad name but I'm afraid that's certainly because in the infirmary they were regular visitors um, with injuries He says that protective clothing was unheard of and quite often of a makeshift character. Sometimes the fumes were so dense and choking we had to abandon sheds for some of the time. Quite often there were frequent fires, uh, which is surprising given the amount of flammable materials. And most alarming thing were the explosions, although, as he says, only one was fatal. There was uh, increasing investment in infrastructure 
to ensure that the plant became a modern works shown here is part of the steam system and on the right hand side the packing off of phallic anhydride an important intermediate in the dye stuffs and later plastics business by the mid 20s the site was employing 250 people. I've already mentioned John Thompson. John Thompson was a inspiring and innovative chemist who hadn't trained originally as a dye stuff chemist, but had worked in Nobel's explosives. It came to work with Morton first as a research chemist and then became the site manager and later managing director of the company. He died quite young and was described by his colleagues as a British Duisburg and that is a, an important comparison because the largest and most successful German company IG Farben uh, would have been uh, aware of his presence. Morton was quite happy with the recognition that he received from his own colleagues and those that work for him, but he also received a number of other awards, including the Faraday Medal. As it happened, he was a fan of Michael Faraday, the famous uh, scientist from the uh, 19th century, who, like himself, had had a humble beginning without much uh, formal education but had gone on to great things in chemistry and electromagnetism. By the mid-twenties German industry had regained its strength and under the leadership of the Karl Duisberg I mentioned IG Farben was formed of the important and large chemical firms that were operating to further consolidate the country's position in chemicals, including dye stuffs. The British response came from both Alfred Mond and Harry McGowan, who between them run the Brunner Mon Company and Nobel's Explosives two of the largest chemical companies at the time. They proposed joining together the big chemical companies in Britain to form a single larger company. They signed the documents that led to the formation of the company on a trip back from a meeting in New York. Famously, Harry said to Alfred Mond, we're not getting off this boat until you've agreed to these proposals. The proposal led to the formation of ICI, which was Imperial Chemical Industries, by the bringing together of the four big chemical companies shown here, Brunner Mond, Nobel's, the British Dye Corporation and United Alkali. Alfred Mon became the first chairman of ICI and Harry McGowan his deputy. ICI brought with it the legacy of its founding companies including that of Brunner Mond. Brunner Mond had founded their company in the 1870s in Cheshire. On the left we have a great picture of the site employees in the process uh, side in the early 1930s. In fact, Brunner Mond's ethos brought with it better worker relations, 
better terms and conditions and a process of worker consultation through works councils. This was at somewhat at odds by some of the poor industrial relations taking part as a result of the recession in the 30s. And also uh, its interest in health and safety, which at the time was fairly pioneering. ICI was to grow in size over the next 60 odd years and become a well-known British company, often described as a bellwether of the British stock market. It acquired Scottish dyes in 1928 through its holding of the British dye company when Morton just saw that it was probably better now to amalgamate with the larger parent to improve funding for research and development and expanding the plant further. Around this time a new innovation took place with the accidental discovery of a new pigment in Grangemouth in 1928. One of the chemists observed that while bubbling ammonia through phthalic anhydride to make phthalamide, there had been a blue discoloration in the batch, but he discovered the coloration had resulted from exposure in the vessel of some iron in, due to a crack in the enamel coating. It was possible for chemists to take the ideas and launch a new range of pigment products known as the monastral pigments. He also uh, experimented um, with replacing iron with copper and hence made a range of blue and green pigments. These became very important both in the use in paints or plastics and famously used in the green plastic bags that were uh, popular in Marks and Spencers for many years. A new plant was eventually built in the 1960s to produce a large tonnage of monastral pigments, having initially been made in other works around the UK. It has been said that um, the copper phallocyanine pigment was one of the greatest pigments of the 20th century. It did take some time to commercialize it to get the right forms that uh, would have been acceptable for the various applications. At the time, 1969, this was a major investment at the site and the plant shown here in its latter years went on to operate for over 30 years exporting the pigment worldwide. It was always a difficult operating environment because the green pigments got everywhere. So by the end of the 30s, there had been a big impact as a result of ICI's ownership with improvements in plant equipment, process technology, health and safety and welfare of workers. All of the AQ VAT dyes around the UK, many being produced in the north of England, were now relocated and focused on Grangemouth. By the 30s, there was a general expansion and growth in plant building and new techniques were brought in. In the welfare area, a recreation club was created in the grounds of the original house that Dundas family had owned. The recreation club was a very popular place many different 
sports, rugby, football, bowling, hockey were played by employees and their families over the next 70 years. Not only sports, of course, but many social activities. Picture from the 40s here of uh, bridge players and uh, here's a club uh, dance, a regular feature. Sometimes the club was referred to as the matrimonial bureau uh, for employees. A chance to meet with locals and relax after a day at work. To this day, there's still support from the companies that operate there uh, for some of the young people in the community, such as those uh, given by Syngenta, one of the, the large companies still operating on the site, who sponsor a local youth football team. Unfortunately, the um, recreation activities had to cease on site when new planning regulations meant that uh, the public could not be uh, safely accommodated in this type of facility so close to a chemical plant. In 1939 the town of Grangemouth and its chemical industry were soon to take an active part in the war effort. Scottish Aviation Limited had built an airport, the largest in the country, at Grangemouth on 500 acres of farmland and the port was to serve as an important supply point for the Northern Fleet and also for a fuel stock. Preparations for war also begun on the Earl's Road. It was certainly true that um, during the war troops would face as great a risk of infection and disease um, and this became a, an urgent call to produce medicines and pharmaceuticals. Grangemouth site was selected to produce one of the critical antibacterial um, products. ICI had started to investigate the synthesis of pharmaceuticals given its um, knowledge of organic chemistry in the 1930s. Sulfonamide was moved into Grangemouth in the 1940s in a plant called H2. And here it's shown. Another important product manufactured during the war at uh, Grangemouth was going to be the anti-malarial drug, Mepacrin. The Japanese had captured the malarial drug raw materials from which quinine was produced. These were mainly natural derivatives at the time and it was concerning that uh, British troops and allies would run short of this important anti-malarial. The L2 plant was built in record time to produce the anti-malarials. In fact it was a part adaptation of an earlier plan for a dye plant which was adapted into a modern drug manufacturing plant at the last moment. The plant still exists and is still operating in some form to this day, although no longer in the manufacture of antimalarials. In the 30s, females were brought into the laboratories initially as support, but later as chemists. Of course, many women were employed in traditional clerical and support roles. With the onset of war, 
and many men leaving to join the services, women were able to find jobs both in the process side and engineering during the war. This is a great photograph of a local lady who still lives in Grangemouth who remembers her time working in the process and research labs during the early 1940s. Grangemouth was at the forefront of developing new photochromatic analytical techniques for dye stuffs from the 1940s. Here's this uh, panorama I referred to before of the site taken from the top of the boiler house chimney. By the 1949-50 period, there were over 400 processes on site and the site had grown up to employ 1400 people. This had put the site in a great place for the post-war expansion. The town was always proud to have the site in its midst and regularly open days were very popular. In the post-war period there was expansion of the dyes business and drugs also at Grangemouth. Here are two pictures, one on the left of the G2 plant starting up in 1949 and another of the 1960s in one of the traditional intermediate plants. After the war there were of course financial challenges. Although Britain had successfully won the war in 1945 there were now pressures on the economy and an export drive was required which Grangemouth Works was a key part. Among other of the new products that were brought into the site after the war included cyclopropane which was a gas anesthetic successfully manufactured in its own plant for almost 40 years. Here is a picture of the 1950s on site. The last part of the post-war expansion was to include the development of the north site of the Earls Road. Here we see the construction of a pipe bridge which was eventually to span the Earls Road, perhaps not the latest in health and safety arrangements, uh, watching the workers and the supervisor uh, on top of the pipe bridge. Here's the plant that was built in the 50s, known as 1-3 plant, one of the largest at the time medicinal plants in the company. It was designed as a multi-product site, producing sulfur drugs, it's still in use today. Bulk medicinal products uh, only continued until the 1980s when the plant was becoming increasingly diversified, uh, particularly in the manufacture of agrochemicals and biocides. But here is uh, an example of uh, the very oldest technology infiltration. Famously, Queen Elizabeth visited the plant in 1955 to look at the new investments that had been taking place since the war. It was the first time the Royal Party had visited an ICI factory anywhere in the UK. Now 40 years into its life as a chemical site, the 1960s brought 
drastic and increasing amounts of change in the industrial landscape and the social landscape illustrated here in the commercial landscape as far as textile manufacturing that should gradually started to migrate to Asia and of course that was to infect the market for dye stuffs and the environmental movement had been given a kick by people such as Rachel Carson drawing attention to the effect that some chemicals were having on the environment. In the 1960s, new laboratory facilities were built. These are a nice example of those. And of course, new colorful dyes were created. Among them, the Procyon dye range. These seem to suit the general era of uh, new fashion, bright, uh, colorful cotton dresses. It was actually an ICI chemist who had originally worked in Grangemouth who invented this new range of reactive dyes in 1954. These are dyes which actually bond with the textile. They were firstly produced in ad hoc plants on the south site in Grangemouth and then larger plant was built at Trafford Park outside Manchester. By the late 60s a new Procyon plant began construction at Grangemouth site and was able to start up in 1969. It went on for many years to produce the Procyon dye range, again being an important export earner for the company and the country. The plant still exists but is used for other applications by the Fuji Film Company. It was a modern plant with computer control operation which ICI had invested in heavily. While investment increased rapidly on the north side of the Earls Road, the old vat dye plants on the south side continued in manufacturing. The site reached its maximum number of employees by the late 70s. It had begun to look at new opportunities to diversify outside its traditions of dye manufacturing into agrochemical and crop protection. The early early to mid 60s had seen an increase in the research and development in agrochemical based products and by the 1970s a new large plant was to be built on the northeast of the Grangemouth site to produce fungicides and insecticides. This allowed the site to be diversified away from its traditional products. Some of the old facilities were also um, retrofitted to produce agrochemicals, such as this building shown here. By the 1980s, time had really run out for many of the old dye stuff plants on the south site for a number of reasons. These included such things as the amount of manual handling requiring a lot of labor and effort, the lack of decent environmental containment in some of the plants. Old fashioned materials such as wooden vats and basically suffering from a lack of investment. And of course, inevitably higher labor costs. 
some of the technologies had been um, superseded and some of the assets were definitely showing their age. As the demand for these traditional dyes reduced, there was a program of rationalization and closure and inevitably some job losses. Those chemical plants that were no longer required or unable to be modified were gradually demolished, leaving much of the south site cleared. Shown here are dye stuffs and dye stuff intermediates that have come from India, which was increasingly the, the trend. As textile manufacturing had moved to Asia, so dyes moved from Europe to Asia too, and the old AQ intermediate and dye plants were closed on the south side, most of them by 1992. The textile colours business was actually sold to a German competitor, BASF, in the mid-90s, although the site did retain its specialist colourants. ICI at this time had started to diversify into totally new areas and new products away from the lower value commodity products that it was originally known for. These were to include making pool disinfectants, pool biocides, biocides for use in other uh, preservative industries and hospital disinfectants. One important new area of investment was into the fluoroaromatics plant. This was a major plant handling some very difficult technology, producing raw materials for new plastics and agrochemicals. It was one of the first new plants to be built on the south site after the closure of many of the old dye stuffs plants. By the late 80s, ICI Group sales were actually very healthy, but of course, uh, things were not going to continue this way forever. There was going to be a serious challenge to the state of the company. Those changes um, were driven by changes in the markets that I've discussed, uh, some of them technological, some of them just the general effect of globalization on European companies. A new company was formed by the demerger of ICI into two separate companies. The new company which took over Grangemouth was known as Zeneca. It became the owner of the Earls Road site, now with about a thousand employees. ICI itself no longer exists. It was eventually absorbed into Axo Nobel in 2007, certainly the end of an era. ICI is actually shown here as having split into many of the different uh, chemical companies that uh, are still in operation from Ineos, uh, Syngenta, um, Huntsman. Uh, some of those groups have been reformed, some have merged with others, so it's a constantly changing picture of ownership, but the large single British chemical company no longer exists. Zeneca went on to sell its speciality business to a private equity film firm. And Avicia, the name of the uh, new company form, became the owner of about three quarters of the site. Zeneca Agrochemicals was merged with the Novartis company in Switzerland to create what is now called Syngenta. You can see here roughly the site split into two parts, the Syngenta site in the northeast and the rest of the Avicia site, which occurred in 1990.
1929. Seneca went on to make a number of investments in what would be called fine chemicals, such as building a plant at Grangemouth to manufacture image polymers for the reprographics industry. As a new company, Zeneca was keen to create good links with the community. It bought a section of land to create an urban wildlife park, which was known as the Jupiter Wildlife Center. The Jupiter Wildlife Park is a very attractive place to visit and has been actively supported by the community. It's operated by the Scottish Wild Life Trust. Here we see the Syngenta's um, site headquarters building. Syngenta is really part of one of the largest crop companies in the world with a headquarters in Switzerland. It had to create the site, as I've said, from the northeast of the original Zeneca site and it has its own entrances and facilities. It was to go on to make significant investments in its discoveries of new fungicide products. The star product amongst them is the Amistar range of fungicides. Over the next 15 years, from the late 90s, there was a significant investment in these new fungicides, which has allowed Syngenta site to be an important part of world crop protection efforts. Avicia, the other part of um, the company sped out from Zeneca was to focus on the manufacture of biochemicals including pharmaceuticals and agrochemicals but also begun to invest in the biotechnology industry. Shown here investments in biotechnology that took place around the turn of the millennium. Avicia was actually able to build the first large-scale DNA medicines facility in the EU. And this operated at a very high standard of uh, good manufacturing practice, which is required for regulated drug production. Before finishing, it's probably worth reflecting on the hundred years since Morton had started the site here in Grangemouth. When James Morton himself spoke in 1930, he was quite proud of his activities, the way that only in a few years he had created uh, with his team over a hundred new VAT dyes, erected the factory and given a large new opportunity to a highly technical industry. That legacy had included creating skilled jobs in Grangemouth, employing many graduate chemists and chemical engineers and other scientists. Of course, many of the employees, such as these two in Syngenta, went on to very long service with the company. And of course, ICI and its successors were at the forefront of developing new technology and taking up health and safety at work, particularly new techniques in making plants more reliable. Those practices led to improvements in performance and a different culture 
on safety. Importantly, rather than relying on the River Karen, improvements had actually begun as early as the 30s to try and get a hold of um, what was happening to effluent released from the plant. But by the 1980s, there were significant investments in building effluent treatment plants. The company in Grangemouth had pioneered worker consultation and flexibility that was allowing um, more indifferent work to be done by the same workforce. The companies that operated on Grangemouth were always proud of their links with the community, whether supporting charities or actively their employees helping out. It was certainly true that by the turn of the millennium, a lot of the land that was originally used for dye dust plants was no longer required and it was decided to create a business park which others could come in and utilize. The park was known as the Earl's Gate Park. This overview of the site as it is today shows something of the reduced footprint of chemical manufacturing activities, but also the development of the Earl's Gate Park, which is now increasingly filled with other types of businesses. Another part of the park was the old recreation grounds, which were sold to a food distribution business. The global financial crisis of 2008 led to even more changes in ownership on site and the business climate and it proved to be a challenging and difficult time in many parts of the chemical industry. And although the technically complex products remain and it is still an important employer in the district, it has been confusing for the local community to say, well, what actually is happening on the old Scottish Dyes ICI site? This gives you some idea of the origins of the four principal businesses that currently operate on the chemical manufacturing part of the site. Syngenta, Calichem, Paramel Healthcare and Fujifilm. Fujifilm in some ways provides the last link to dye manufacturing through its inkjet printing products. Calichem is largely a contract manufacturing company making products for other chemical companies. Paramol Healthcare produces important new advanced drugs by using innovative technologies. And Syngenta, of course, a large crop protection company which is challenged by trying to feed the growing world population and make farming efficient and environmentally friendly. It's certainly been a hundred years of working as a community and working with the community. I've always been struck by the way that uh, all the acquaintances and friendships made during the working life had filtered down through those leaving or retiring or reminiscing on social media. Often those friendships were formed by working together day to day on shifts or at away days or playing games at the old recreation club or taking part in golfing and fishing competitions, hill walking or supporting the local football team.
it's the jovial banter of the mess room or the workshop or working on a difficult project late into the night or traveling in a car club or occasionally the odd romance or a trip to play darts in the pub that have added to a feeling of community that only a long running manufacturing site can truly provide. I don't think those that uh, began building the dye factory in 1919 could have really foreseen how it would have developed, but it is a hundred years later, a great heritage to record and celebrate. James Morton was quite clear on this when he spoke in 1930. In these past eight years, there's been in the dye industry, more enterprise, more concentrated research and proven ability, more real achievement in the discovery of new materials and methods than there had been in the whole of the textile industry in this country in the past 80 years. That pride uh, and the importance of the anniversary was marked on site by the companies that are still operating there in 1919 and a local high school pupil was asked to uh, make a logo to make the celebration and here is a, a, a presentation of plaques to each of the site managers uh, to mark the anniversary. After all the research and uh, collection of materials, um, I finally had to put the work into, into the book and I really enjoyed preparing that and it has been quite successful for the Grangemouth Heritage Trust. Thanks very much for your interest in this presentation.